So uh, we have uh, calling in uh, once again, we have uh, the our infectious disease expert, Fred Brown, and he was off last yes, week. Yes, our, our, very, our very own Dr. Doom. Yes, yes. welcome, sir. He was uh, off last week with some family uh, things he had to deal with, but he's back, so he has lots of things to catch up on. A great slideshow he sent to us earlier. Uh, let's start off with the, well, I'm not sure it was the easy one, but uh, certainly our president has, and, 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 and appears that just about everybody that came in contact with him about a week ago has now come down with COVID. So I guess it's not a hoax, huh? Well, you know, we've gone, uh, my, my guess is that he, uh, that he and the first lady were probably involved in a super spreader event. Uh, and um, it probably occurred, you see all these pictures outside the Rose Garden, it actually probably occurred inside, but in prior there was lots of, and there's an indoor meeting of, of the people. And apparently, um, you know, from the data we can see, uh, most, many of those people weren't tested, uh, even though they were supposed to have been. And uh, that's disappointing because uh, obviously we have the first generation, which uh, kind of takes about 10 days. Then we have a second generation of, of disease that we can expect uh, in about 20 days. And that'll be, of course, to the power, right? Because if you have 10 people who are infected in the first round, they each will infect 2.5 to 3 people. So then you have probably a thousand people affected, and on the third wow. on the third time around, it'll be about ten thousand people uh, that could oh. be affected. Wow! Uh, yeah, that's the way it works, sadly. <laughs> yes, I know. At least impacted. You know, you're not necessarily catching the disease, but at least impacted by by the having having the opportunity to catch the disease. And we don't really know what his condition is. I've been watching all the news reports, and it's like all over the board. Everybody has something different to say. So I don't know what the real situation is. To tell you the truth. Yeah, only his doctors know that's probably appropriate. You know, I, I, I don't I don't think uh, un unless he's incapacitated, which he, he, he doesn't seem to be. Uh, I don't think it's really appropriate that we get into all of his personal medical history uh, necessarily. But I, I do. We do have a list of all the drugs he's on, which we'll go through in a little bit a little, a little bit later. And that's that is interesting, because if you, if you have people who you know who are in the hospital uh, and you want to give them the, well, what, what, some of the better uh, drugs that are out there, I think his list is a pretty good one to start with. At least talk to your doctor about it. There's some additional ones you can add depending on your own situations, but at least it's a, it's, it's a darn good list to start with. I, I think one of the reasons, you know, a lot, one of the complaints that we've been having is that um, you know people have not been uh, traced, so you know there's no kind of tracking and tracing like uh, we we should be doing, and that is because you know probably up, up to as I said, you know every time uh, we're we're squaring that number, uh, just an awful lot of people can get infected by a single incident, and they probably don't want to be known for you know potentially spread up to ten thousand people. <laughs> You know, I wouldn't want it to be either, but that's that's the way this virus works. Sadly, if you're if you're involved with a single super spreader event, it can really move fast through a community. Okay, so well, I what, guess I mean, what what I heard is, and, and tell me if this is accurate to to what you've heard, <clears throat> is that Trump's nominee for the Supreme Court had it over the summer, and um, that yeah, I, I heard that this morning, and you know, and and was considered to be recovered. <clears throat> But oh, yeah, apparently somebody else in the entourage was not. Somebody else was still shedding virus. So. Yeah, there were probably at least three or four people. <clears throat> Given that they, even if they had done tests, there probably would have been at least three or four people in that group. Uh, given our infectivity rate uh, among you know high level uh, executives and uh, and uh, politicians, uh, there should have been at least three to four people with the infection. She probably actually had antibodies and was was, was relatively safe. I didn't know about that. I didn't know that she had had, had the disease over o, o, over the summer. Uh, I'm glad she recovered from it. Uh, it'll be it, it'll it'll be interesting to see, you know how um, we know whether the, whether there's a significant portion of the Senate that's affected. Yeah, yeah, that'll to be determined. So let's take a look at those slides. Oh yes, I'd be happy to. Speaking of, of politics, I thought I'd go a little bit local this time. Talk a little bit about Michigan. See how we're doing. One of the things that happened. Um, of course, over uh, you know on, on October second was the Supreme Court ruled um, that um, what Gretchen Whitmore has been doing is unconstitutional. Uh, that she's been you know continued uh, uh, enforcing uh, enforcing um, uh, her executive orders uh, even after April thirtieth, which is as far as the legislature allowed her to go. Uh, she's been kind of continuing to enforce new orders because. Um, you know, she, I think, felt that she needed to based on the data that was presented to her by experts. Uh, and 
in, in, in full disclosure, I, I am not consulting with the state of Michigan. I, I consult with 17 other states and you know, six uh, countries, uh, uh, but I don't consult the state of Michigan, uh, although I live here, so I'm sort of interested in, <laughs> in what the impact. Well, you know, you know what they say: a prophet is never honored in his own hometown, right? So, that's... <laughs> well, she's getting excellent advice. I, I put her response, okay. you know, as far as the health response, uh, certainly among the top ten states in the country. I mean, we, we we've done a very good job. Part of it is we're in it, we're with it. We're two peninsulas, and that makes it easier, as Korea points out. Um, but uh, but I think overall, she's been responding. You know, as well as can be expected. I, I work with a lot of states that aren't responding as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been sort of jealous of the way Michigan's doing. So uh, I'll, I'll show you so, sort of what I was interested in is if I, you know, so on the first slide, I just said, you know, here are the implications. Basically, she has um, had over 200, about 200 uh, COVID regulations passed under the Emergency Powers Act uh, of 1945. And um, the, by, by my ruling that this action is illegal, about 160 of these regulations that she has passed are uh, been ruled unconstitutional. I guess that takes up the, the, the higher court will, will, will execute this back down to the lower courts who will implement, and that takes about 21 days um, from the point of the ruling. That would be October 23rd, 25th kind of time frame. Uh, and at that point, uh, if the court moves forward with that, which are expected to, of course, following the Supreme Court's ruling, uh, then, then, that, then that would be one uh, unconstitutionality takes effect. But immediately, uh, the AG, the Attorney General, is going to stop enforcing the rules. Not that these rules were that on onerous to begin with. I mean, none of them required jail time. They were all misdemeanors. There were, there were some fines. Most of them are pretty hard to enforce, frankly. I don't think they've been terribly enforced <laughs> from what I can tell. I do, I do consult the state of Hawaii and there we had several people getting $10,000 fines for disobeying mm -hmm. rules. So that, that, that sort of, you know, that sort of you know, sends you to tension when you realize you got, you got to have to pay 10,000 bucks. But here we don't tend to do that as much. And uh, you know, uh, Hawaii is sort of an outlier because uh, they are so concerned about their island getting taken over. In Germany, Switzerland, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a citizen in Switzerland, uh, it, it can be $50,000 if you're caught 50, up that. 50000 Oh, wow. yeah. Oh, yeah. Easy. Easy. If, especially if you do it once, twice, three times. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's where all the little bald guys are with the money. So And, 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 they, and trust me, they, they make sure you pay it. You know, yeah. you, you will have <laughs> you'll have police on your door at, at that evening. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, you know, that, that just gives you a sense of, you know, uh, you know, people who the countries who are really taking this very seriously and and you know people who are passing laws but don't really tend to enforce them that much which is more of the, the where, where we are in the united states mm -hmm. um the hhs does have you know health and human services does have authority in each of the different areas of the country they've got eight we have i'm sorry in the state we've got eight regions and the hhs can go ahead and limit crowd size in the event of epidemics but unfortunately the hhs if you think about it really doesn't have any police force uh, or charging, or they can't really charge anybody to if they if they break the rules that they passed. So uh, it's probably not going to be terribly effective. And of course, the governor can continue to work with the House and Senate to enact COVID legislation in the future. And I certainly hope they do. Uh, but you know, so far they seem to be, have been pretty deadlocked. So you know, this is my interpretation. I have talked to a couple of lawyers. It's a, the ruling is 107 pages long. I have looked at some of the summaries, <laughs> like the, the, the you know the cheat sheets uh, and, and and read some articles. But I'm not a lawyer, so I maybe I, I don't think I've misinterpreted this. Um, and I, of course, I don't consult the state, so I'm not involved directly in all the all the decision making. But uh, this is what I believe is the case, and what everyone has reported to be the case. So there are five big areas that we really uh, tried to enforce. The first one was the mask mandate. And uh, you, you can read the, the actual law. Um, this is that says that you've got to maintain your six feet of distance. You have to be able to, you can't just tell all your customers you can go ahead and not wear masks. Everyone's allergic to masks. Uh, you have to actually enforce the mask if you've got customers who are uh, in, in public places. Um, and uh, and uh, so that's, that's the rule. And that seems pretty reasonable. You know, it doesn't seem to be out of the ordinary. It's mostly is very aligned with what is recommended. Um, although, you know, I guess people are unhappy about having to wear masks. But if you're, in, if you're, if you can't maintain distance and you're pretty close to people, uh, you should probably be wearing them. You should definitely be wearing a mask. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Restaurants at 50% capacity. This says that you have to, wear all, there are about 20 rules they have to, uh, you have to uh, obey. They reopened in June. Uh, as you know, but they said 50% normal seating uh, and all groups must be separated by six feet or more. And this is standard. Uh, you know, if you can't separate more than six feet, the aerosols are going to come and get you, especially if you're sitting there for 45 minutes waiting for your dinner. 
So uh, that, this, that, this makes a lot of sense in my, in my estimation as a, as a health professional. Um, and you're supposed to wear masks at all times. So if you go to the bathroom, get up, take a look around, you're supposed to wear a mask. You're not coughing on people as you walk by them and, and infecting their food, which makes sense. Of course, if an employee comes down with COVID, you also want to close down the restaurant because you don't want people you know, serving food um, you know, uh, with having COVID. Uh, and of course, you don't want to you know, go to buffets and drink stations and things like that. So those are all, those are all shut down by that order. And so that's now no longer constitutional. Um, gathering limits. Uh, you can, indoor venues, 20 people per thousand square feet, as long as people wear masks. This is again about the six foot rule. Outdoor venues, 30 people per thousand square feet or 30% seating capacity. That gives you a sense of where they are. And this is pretty standard. Uh, almost all states have this in place as a at least a recommendation, if not a law. Uh, bar closures, they shut down all bars that uh, were where um, they had at least 70% of their sales coming from alcohol. But the problem is we don't really track this at all. <laughs> so we really couldn't tell who's, who's a bar, who's not a bar. Uh, and it wasn't enforced. So uh, we didn't really have an enforcement there. Uh, and you probably don't want to you know, go to bars who aren't enforcing this and having a lot of, lot to drink because you start to lower your, <laughs> you start to become more, more friendly and then start lowering your guards. And uh, that, that, that adds a lot of challenges, especially if there's a lot of lo loud music playing and you got a sharp shout over the, the stereo system. So that, that, that probably made, that also makes a lot of sense to me. Unfortunately, it's now unconstitutional according to the Supreme Court and worker office space. So if you go to work uh, before you were protected because uh, Michi people in work Michigan who could re remote work, uh, work remotely are required to keep working remotely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then they also laid out requirements for office space, including distancing and six foot distancing and signs about personal hygiene around Ryan uh, again, to distance tech, high touch services. All this to me makes a lot of sense. It's all very much aligned with every other state that I've worked with. Uh, and in fact, every state that I've worked with has made this a law, uh, not, not as far as the emergency order, but it just be has become law. And Michigan has used the emergency order rather than the law. Uh, but, um, but this is very typical for most states and most states, um, you know, I think this is also responsible, responsible for most citizens to follow. So what happens now? What happens now? These are unconstitutional. Mask mandate, restaurant searches and capacity, gathering limits no more, bar closures no more, working off space, you have to go to work if, you, if, are, if your boss tells you or they can fire you. So what happens? Well, we've done some analysis and there is um, the IHME, which is out of University of Washington, is, is, the, is the model that actually the, the White House follows, this is the model that President Trump follows. And they actually calculated what will happen if we continue with our current law or we allow easing. And the continuation of the current law is in the brown. And uh, you can see that we're anticipating that. Um, and this is very, I, I have my own model, uh, but this is within 10% of my model. So uh, it's, it's very, you know, and it's pretty conservative, frankly. It could be a lot worse than this. It probably won't be better than this. Um, and, uh, and we've got, you can see that basically if you ease, we think we're gonna have 37,658 on average within our confidence interval, extra cases. Hmm. And if you think about each, how much each case costs, Avalier is probably the leading consultant in this space. And um, they're saying it costs $23,489 per patient in the United States. You, hmm. Michigan's a little bit more expensive than average. It's probably around 25, 26,000. I just use their average to be conservative. Some people are, cons are estimating that these costs are actually closer to 70,000, especially if you're uninsured, but hmm. 22,000 is an average. Yeah, yeah, it costs a lot of money to go to the hospital. You know, <laughs> you, you be there a couple of days, you're sitting there, you know, you know it's, 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 uh, it's expensive. And then of course, you know that about a third of the uh, uh, of patients have long haul effects. And uh, what I did is I, I said, well, you know, if you look at the long haul effects, these are, these are effects that you cannot cure. Sc permanent scarring of the, of, 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 of the lungs, tachycardia and permanent uh, inflammation of the heart, uh, central nervous problems. Heart and central nervous problems are a lot more expensive. I use the COPD cost per year of 5,200. If you use heart lungs, it's about, it's probably, uh, it's probably close to seven times that. So it'll probably cost you between 25 and $50,000 a year. But let's just use $5,000 a year uh, times 12,427 patients is $1.3 billion of cost hmm. that this, uh, this is going to cost us as a result hmm. of, of the, um, of, and that, that just in the next two months. And you can see that this, this curve keeps rising, right? I mean, it's, it's not stopping. There's nothing to stop it at this point, right? We don't have mask wearing. We don't have people, we don't have gathering limits. We don't have bar limits. We don't have employer limits. So it, it, and without, without if the, the, the virus, you know, nature is just going to keep going. 
So this 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 graph is, it shows upward trend. That's not going to curve down. The bell curve isn't isn't automatic. It's something they have to work on. So that's going to keep going. And then, then when you throw in the seasonal flu, right? Oh, you throw in the seasonal flu with another two hundred thousand patients. And all of a sudden, you're getting pretty close to overwhelming some of our hospitals, and that causes death to go up. Well, I didn't even throw that in, by the way. Uh, Mike, just the issue where. Um, here's what our death rate looks like. And you can see that basically the Supreme Court ruling that just occurred is going to cost us about three times the deaths. Hmm. Most of these people will be in their 70s and 80s, but there'll be a good number of them who are in their uh, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, a good number, probably you know, 10, 15, 20 percent. So you can see that we're really going to pay a lot for this for health, for our health, uh, unfortunately. Now, it may have been the right thing to do legally. Um, uh, the first, uh, there, were, there were two big big things that were struck down. The first was the 1976 law that was unanimous, but the other law was interesting. It was by, it was, it was struck down by Democrats uh, and Republicans. The Democrats voted three uh, to, against uh, voting it down and the and Republicans voted it uh, four for voting it down. So somehow it looks like politics really got into this decision. And if you're gonna be political about your decision, then you should be held accountable for the full costs. And so, you know, next time you see a Supreme Court judge, you know, you ask them why it's going to cost us 250 people a day dying uh, in order to preserve the law that they felt that politically they had to support. It's disappointing. Well, since uh, we're since we're choosing the Supreme Court a month from now, uh, November 3rd, I guess these are relevant questions to ask, right? Absolutely. Uh, I think I think I think it's a fair thing to ask, to, to, to ask them about and, and hold them accountable to. Um, so when you add all the deaths up, it's going to be about, about 2000 extra deaths. Hmm. And if you do the math, we, 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 you know, that's about 20.4. That's just the, the standard calculation that, uh, that the government uses for, for the worth, the, the, the wealth, the worth of a person, uh, then using that number is about, uh, is about $20.4 billion wow. Of, of, of cost that this is going to cost us. And that's just in the next two months. We're not talking about a year from now. We're talking about the next two months. <laughs> you know, this is a very, very expensive decision that was made with, you know, um, with, without much consideration, I think, about the health, the health consequences. What do you think the likelihood is that even though some of these rules have been struck down, that the business establishments or the patrons may still, you know, do the things they're supposed to do? Is that likely or not? I think it'll be mixed. I think there are a few that really want to open up, you know, and, and uh, they've been pushing hard to open up. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been a push, you know, to have put the, brought this forward at the Senate and, and House of Representative level. Well, yeah, that, and, and Dr. Fauci was just quoted as saying that we're going to have to hunker down this fall and winter. I, I, I feel like I've been hunkering since March. You know, I haven't I haven't been in a restaurant or a bar since March. I only go grocery shopping when I need to. It's not like, you know, yeah, I, well, and and if I if I'm in a place with, where people are wearing masks, I'm right out the door. I know, oh, it's, it's smart. I'll tell, uh, I think that's probably smart, uh, just because this thing is so contagious. And and uh, you know, uh, I, I was up north last month, last, last, last week, and uh, I, I went to these different groups, and they and, and I went to all these different shops, and I went shopping with my wife. She wanted to buy some new things, and they each of them said that each one of them had been sort of. Um, you know, people come in without their masks, and they really didn't know what to do about it. And they didn't really want to be not, you know, uh, you know, un, you know, uh, kind of uh, unsupportive uh, of potential customers. So they didn't really say anything. But I think every every business now, uh, you know, had that challenge with the law on their side. Now they have this challenge <laughs> without the law on their side, and of course they're not allowed to say anything. So I think um, that that's that's uh, disappointing because I think it, you know, you want to encourage your laws to encourage good citizenship. And in this case, we really need to we need to hunker down for probably another year. I hate to say it, but that's about how long it's going to take for a good vaccine to come through. For all <laughs> I, think, I think Mike's hiding behind his microphone. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, so, so the question has been how, how difficult have, the, you know, we've got a, all this seems to be a lot of political fervor about these, 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 these executive orders. And so I wanted to kind of compare, and in fact, the, uh, the, the, this is actually in the model, it kind of compares, um, you know, what, what we've been doing and they said in Michigan, we're about 35% compliant with mask use. So if you go around and you figure every chance you get to wear a mask versus how much you really wear a mask, is about 35% of the time. And I have to admit, I, I'm probably at that level. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, when I think about all the chances I should have been wearing a mask and, 
didn't I say probably a third of the time I've been doing it right and about two thirds of the time, you know, I'll, and I'll be out there and uh, I, I, I won't have more than that. I try to do better than that. But, but that's about saying about on average, you know, based on observation, and they, and they do this out of the University of Maryland, Michigan's about 35%. That's, that's, per, that's about the same around the country, about 35%. Now, if you were in Taiwan, you'd be a real outlier because in Taiwan, where they really do wear masks effectively, they're at 95%. So I mean they're they're wearing masks to bed. I I know I'm joking. I, I, I you know, every time you see someone outside, you will almost always see someone wearing a mask, and that's because they actually enforce this pretty carefully. So that's that sort of gives you a sense of where you know how to compare yourself with how really invasive the executive orders have been. And I I don't think they've been that invasive. You know if you really th think back on it, compared to how much how many lives they've saved and how much good they've probably done. Um, but you know, for some people, it's been it's been a, it's been a challenge, and for some business, it's been a challenge. Now, the other big question is about mobility, and this is coming out of the mobility matrix from your phone, and people are tracking how much mobility there is. And you can see that back in April, we were way down; we were minus sixty five percent, sixty eight percent mobility rating, and right now we're at about ten percent. So, mm -hmm. you know, in other words, what you're doing in nineteen nine uh, twenty nineteen uh, compared to what you're doing this year at this time. The, the, the difference is about 10%. So we really, we're not really that impacted by these executive orders, even though they seem to be getting a lot of attraction uh, and having a lot of political fallout. And in fact, if we were to say, let's not, let's go ahead and, and, uh, and uh, try to get to the same health effect that these, uh, these five mandates create, how much mobility would I have to stop if I stopped wearing masks, doing all these other things that now are being required? And the answer is you'd have to stop moving around 63%. You'd have to be down at where you were in April to get to the same public health effect as this sudden Supreme Court mandate says, let's eliminate all these new, let's limit all these rules. Uh, if you really want to get down to the same health effect, you've got to stop moving around by 60%. That is a big imposition in my point, in my view, and allow a, a lot of people who don't want to, or some people not to wear, to do all these things that I think are important and to impose then me having to stop moving around 63% in order to keep, maintain the same level of health effectiveness that to me is a big, a much bigger imposition on my, on me than I was having on you asking you to wear a mask and, and not having gatherings of, uh, of more than twenty people on a thousand square feet. So I think the Supreme Court got this really wrong. If I if I had to say in terms of impact of the health, impact on the law, and our ability to act and and be free, I think the Supreme Court got this wrong. I really do. So what's the real cost? Let's take a look. If you add it all up, I only talked about two months, right? Let's just pretend. That for the that, that that upward curve just stops all of a sudden in December and goes flat. That's not going to really happen, but that's all that's all the numbers I could work with IHME, my my own numbers I've got, but it, I didn't want to I didn't want to affect that. So let's just hold IHME numbers steady at January first levels all the way through. That's not going to happen. It's going to go uh, way up and way down, but uh, it, it, it let's just hold it steady. If we do that, then over the course of the year, the GDP impact just over the next twelve months until we get a vaccine, if we're lucky will be $2.7 billion. Oh. That's, that's direct out-of-pocket costs. So you can ask the Supreme Court justices, was it worth $2.7 billion to you know, impose this thing for the next 12 months that really impacts our ability to move around that to, to, and to stay healthy? Uh, so the best scenario of the one year, that, that, that's for the GDP impact for the next two months. So we have to multiply that by six for the full year, 16.2 billion bucks. If you closed every restaurant in the state, every restaurant, didn't allow them to open at all, that would cost $17.9 billion. You could have paid every restaurant <laughs> pretty much to stay completely closed <laughs> for the whole year and broken even on this whole deal. And that's a shame. Or certainly every fitness club, every, every restaurant, every, you, know, you could have shut them down and said, here's your money. Go ahead. Here's your money. Because that's as much as it's going to cost us anyway uh, for the Supreme Court to go through. Wow. And... Uh, and furthermore, the other problem is that the long haul effects and the uh, and, and uh, the excess deaths are going to be with us for 20 years. Hmm. And if you do that math, that's about three and a half percent of our economy in the state of Michigan every year for the next 20 years. Wow. We're at a deficit. So you have to ask them, you know, what, what, is it worth it? Is it really worth it to impose on all of our freedoms? Uh, you know, uh, the changing of the law. And then the biggest issue, I think, is the fact that Michigan is going to be unable to respond quickly. 
just as we're going into the fall season, just as we're going into the flu season, just as COVID is gonna get ramp up at speed uh, in, the, in the cold. So this is exactly the wrong time to have this opinion. It's gonna really impact us badly. And we won't be able to uh, uh, control outbreaks across the state. We'll have you know little HHS kind of interventions in Grand Rapids and Detroit, and everyone will be moving around the state and infecting each other. And it just comes back to the fact that we've got an exponential growth epidemic, an exponential growth virus, and all we can do is respond linearly, right? We, it takes us time, it takes us, and, and, and the governors want, this is the only one in this position, and I think President Trump knew that when they said the governors have to respond. Here, you guys have to do this. And it's unfortunate that the Supreme Court in Michigan has been the only state in the country to override the government's ability to have executive orders, in my, in, 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 if I understand it right. And that really uh, is going to hurt us as a state. Right now, we're doing better than most states. And in the future, we'll be doing a lot worse than most states. And that'll take about, it'll take about in the, in the, in the November timeframe to start to feel this, but we will definitely feel this. And as far as individual impact, if this happens and the Supreme Court decides in November, it won't come out until you know, June, that the ACA is, is also unconstitutional, then if you're not insured, you can expect to pay about $73,000 for a year for your hospital uh, stay for COVID on average, not the 23,000 that Avalier pointed out to and that were Medicare and negotiated insurance rates, it'll be $73,000 $73, per person in the uninsured space. And if you've got long haul, it'll probably consider, be considered a pre-existing condition and you can expect to pay, pay, pay about $20,000 a year out of pocket for your COPD problems. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to cut you off at that. We got a hard right. stop at three because uh, uh, Dave has another show he has to produce. So. I understand. Uh, let's, uh, uh, what do you want to leave folks with here in the last 30 seconds? This, this is pretty scary. It is. I, I wanted to say that the, the good news is we have a better sense of what's going on with what to take. This is what President Trump is taking. And uh, you should, you know, if you're in the hospital, if you're, uh, uh, if you have family members who are in the hospital, talk to your doctors about this course of treatments, uh, and, uh, see if you can improve the outcomes for your own family. Traditional right. four-year students love Lawrence Technological University's thriving campus life, but LTU has always met non-traditional students' needs too. Lawrence Tech offers over 100 degree and certificate programs that can get adult students started or back on track. And most of our classes are conveniently offered evenings at our beautiful Southfield campus or online so you can balance your social, family, and work life even while you power up your career. Lawrence Tech where blue devils dare.